Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Reimagine 2021 version 11, our virtual conference series, bringing you nothing but the best projects, bright minds, and leaders in the space. My name is Miguel Vasquez, and with us right now is Sergey Gorbanov, co-founder and CEO of the Axelar Network, a decentralized network of tools that connects assets, users, and dApps across multiple blockchain ecosystems. Uh, Dr. Gorbanov's dissertation on designing cryptographic tools for the cloud using lattice-based cryptography received the Sproul's Doctoral Thesis Award for Best Thesis in Computer Science at MIT. He later went on to lead the founding cryptographic team at Algorand. But Sergey, let me ask you right out of the gate, how is Axelar different from other cross-chain protocols or utilities? And what was the problem that you all set out to solve? Yeah, so first of all, uh, great to be here. And uh, it's a great question. So um, on the high level, if you look at the space, there's um, kind of few categories of projects that are out there. There's application uh, specific uh, interoperability protocols. I think ThorChain is a good example. So it was built uh, specifically to you know, address a specific use case to swap one asset for another, right? Um, then you have consensus uh, dependent interoperability protocols. Uh, for example, IBC in the Cosmos ecosystem. Uh, in Polkadot, there is its own version of uh, interoperability protocols. And those work quite well, but only within those native ecosystems, right? So IBC can be used to transfer assets across Tendermint chains. And while, you know, in principle, you could try to extend it to other chains, it's actually a very lengthy process because it, it requires a lot of dependency on the consensus. And then as a result, we started to see a lot of kind of a, a one-off bridging solutions that have been built in the market. But the reality is that uh, a lot of them ended up being incredibly centralized, right? So it's pretty easy to build up a bridge between one chain and another and kind of interoperate um, across them. But um, you're effectively putting at custody all of the assets uh, to a centralized party that is responsible for that bridge. So that, that cannot scale. If we want to connect decentralized networks, uh, we need a better approach uh, with the decentralized interoperability protocols. And so that's how we started Axler with the goal to A, easily and securely onboard as many chains as possible with a uh, protocol that's sort of consensus agnostic. So it can plug in everything from Bitcoin, you know, Ethereum, modern proof of stake chains like Avalanche, as well as IBC chains. Um, and at the end of the day, make it easy for developers to build on top of these protocols and leverage all of these multiple ecosystems, which today does not exist. Users still have to go through all these bridges, understand various versions of the wrapped assets, this and that, and that that, that, that has to be eliminated. Yeah, I guess that's um, probably the first kind of uh, trepidation point that the end user has is getting into that kind of wrapped asset class, because I think the general uh, concern there is that kind of once you start getting into those other ecosystems, you start to get into that 51% problem. And I believe that Axelar, y'all are trying to develop some sort of, um, so that that 51 number is much higher. Is that correct? Uh, you mean in terms of the trust assumptions? Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, yes, sir. yeah, yeah. I mean, on the trust assumptions, I think, you know, whenever you interoperate across networks, you always will have to trust kind of the source chain and the destination chain, right? And the, its validator sets and sort of Axelar, uh, you know, being a uh, decentralized network in the middle, you would have to put trust on it. And I think we're putting all kinds of, you know, safety and liveness uh, precautions in the protocol to try to, to minimize that, uh, that, that process. Uh, the reality at the same time is that in a lot of the blockchains today, uh, especially when you talk about proof of stake networks, um, most of the top validators are the same actors, right? Um, it's uh, um, you have a group that sort of you know runs the services professionally, and uh, you effectively uh, trust in um, you know those validators and their service, and uh, that the network uh, has done a good job of distributing its stake across all of them. And so we're going to be doing all the best practices that we've seen in the industry to um, to kind of uh, satisfy that as well. Sure. And let's talk about that. That what that word liveness actually means kind of um, for just the layman, because I was reading a little bit of this and I'm not a cryptographer. Uh, I'm just barely a computer scientist. Um, but that kind of that idea of liveness and what it has to do with security and, and why it's so important. Yeah, so um, when we talk about liveness, you know, in a standard blockchain system, right, we're talking about it's effectively it's uptime, right? So is it easy to uh, take down the network? Right. And what is the threshold of the validators that are required 
to be offline for the network to halt. And the reason this is bad for the users is, of course, you know, if you own some assets right on a on a blockchain network, if the validators uh, kind of go down and you can't transfer those assets, then then you're stuck, right? Like you're waiting until other validators can um, can come online. And so the liveness parameter is uh, you know pretty critical in a lot of the systems. Um, so that you want to make sure that um, if the uh, a few at least validators you know go offline, the network doesn't break and so on and so forth. And when you discuss an interoperability protocols, it's the same um, analysis that you have to make, right? So for instance, you own an asset on a chain A and you want to go to a chain B, right? Um, kind of a, what is the liveness threshold uh, that's required to be achieved in order for um, the transfer to actually succeed, right? And if there are some validators in this process that are somehow corrupt, um, will the network go down? So if you, let's say you move one asset from a chain A to a chain B, now what happens if you wanna go back, right? Like if the validator set is all of a sudden unavailable, then you won't be able to go, to go back, right? And so you wanna maximize this, uh, you know, um, the threshold as much as possible. And um, again, it's sort of a standard parameter in all of the blockchains and the sort of Axler interoperability protocol being decentralized has to, has to think about that liveness parameter as well. Absolutely. I guess um, it, kind of in the abstract, it's easy to, to, to think about these things, but then when we start looking at the way they're actually used um, in the, the real world, or I guess on the internet, how mm -hmm. would the end user, how is the end user going to uh, interact with Axelar? Because I know a couple of these other chains, um, Algorand, uh, you know, Link, they all have coins. And I did go and take a look a little bit on uh, Axelar's uh, web page and yeah. it looks like y'all are y'all have set up the test net and all that sort of thing so is there going to be a coin eventually maybe we can talk about a roadmap kind of heading forward yeah so axler itself uh, is a proof of stake network so there is a governance token that's responsible for um you know securing the network essentially users can um delegate their stake to the validators and the validators run the uh, cross-chain consensus protocol that we have and responsible for process processing these uh, cross-chain transactions, right? So um, as a user, you can um, do all those uh, functions. Um, and um, uh, yeah, at the end of the day, what our hopes is that um, if you look at Axler and the, the roadmap kind of in longer term, what we're trying to achieve is to make sure that users can interact with any application, any asset, no matter where it is, right? So that they don't have to hold, you know, Axler token. They don't have to own like AvaX tokens if you want to, you know, transact on, on Avalanche. If I own something on Ethereum and I see an interesting application on Avalanche or Solana or Cosmos ecosystem, I should be able to go and use it, right? Like that's as simple as that. The reality that to get there, there is a whole layer of protocols that has to be built, right? So right now, Axel Network is building this foundational infrastructure overlay network, you can think of it that way, right? So connects all those different ecosystems, just setting up core pipes and, uh, you know, some bridges along the way. And then at the, and then the second phase will be to build sort of application layer protocols so that applications can integrate and then give this accessibility to their apps, to all of the users in the ecosystem, right? And so I think, you know, if you look at a good example is right now we're talking on, um, you know, on Zoom, right? And the traffic goes through all kinds of networks, but we don't see that, right? Like we're not, you know, sending our packets from one network to another, uh, you know, it, that would be obscene. So uh, what made this possible is this layers of layers of interoperability protocols that were built over the last 30 years on the internet. And so uh, we are actually trying to do the same and uh, we have to start at the groundwork right now uh, in order to be able to build upon this foundation. Yeah, I do think that that's the major hurdle right there is because once the 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 crypto enthusiast their one of their first lessons is once they cross chain it's oh wait I kind of need gas fees for that other chain and you know hey I don't have any of that now oh my gosh it's stuck and I've had a bunch of friends and people I know in real life like hey my stuff's all stuck and I go and take a look and no you just need a little BNB or something man like it's right there. Yeah. So that's that's really the problem that Axel are trying to solve is that kind of, for lack of a better term, a gas fees going between chains. It, it's more than gas fees. It's about 
I don't want you to ever have to go through a bridge. Like I think, you know, um, Acceler, you know, we'll build prob uh, a bridge uh, for the initial um, kind of a launch just because, um, you know, there's a, again, like a, a missing protocols that will have to be built for the applications to uh, integrate. But the end goal is that as a user, you don't see a difference between different networks, right? Like if you trust an asset issuer and you own that asset, and you trust an application issuer to make the best choice for that application and build it on the platform that makes sense for that application, you should just go and use it, okay? Like from your wallet, you go and use that application and, uh, um, you know, gas fees is a part of the equation, but there is like, there is more to this. Like, I just don't want you to hop from one network to another and like one wallet to another wallet and like, you know, one bridge app to another bridge app and like, oh my God, what happened to my transaction? <laughs> Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, the end user that should just be the whole blockchains of whatever should be yeah. agnostic to the end user, right? So exactly. at this point in the development, I guess, what is the next big hurdle for for y'all? Is it do we need people to come out and test it? Do you need um other uh, blockchains to help inter interact with uh the platform? What is what is the major hurdle right now? I mean, for us, we're in the test network environment, just setting up these, you know, uh, core pipes, as I mentioned. Um, so we are uh, onboarding testnet uh, participants all the time. I think we have close to kind of 600 participants on the testnet right now. We have uh, dozens of validators that are running nodes and, uh, you know, participating in the protocol. So we're we're learning a lot from the network behavior. We are making it easy to onboard new chains so that, you know, uh, effectively um, you can come into the network type, you know, five or six commands, and then assuming the validators can also support that chain, that it becomes integrated through the um, interoperability stack supported by the uh, Axelon network. So, uh, and I think over the next, you know, few months, uh, we're going to be in that mode. Um, we also recently, uh, you know, started our audits around the core functionalities of the protocol. So we're going to, you know, learn the um, kind of results from that, fix bugs, uh, kind of iterate through that. And, you um, and then we'll go from there. Not to get too technical into it, <clears throat> excuse me, not to get too technical into it, but maybe we could talk a little bit about some of the um, interesting challenges that go into building new blockchains, things that you've seen in, in your long experience uh, building out the security of these things. Um, I even know that, you know, sometimes uh, you've got experience in this too, is new cryptography is developing. Maybe you can just explain in kind of a layman's terms, some of the things that are going into that. And, um, you know, because I think even people just barely uh, introduced to crypto kind of understand what SHA-256 is. But, right. you know, y'all are really on the bleeding edge. So if you could just give us a little bit of um, what's going on over there. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, so on a high level, if you think about how Axler works, there's an Axler network, right? And on different chains, we have what we call as gateways. Okay, those gateways have a notion of like multi-party keys that are set up, right? And valid Axel validators collectively make decision about which request should go in and out of those gateways, okay? So if there is a transfer from chain A to chain B, the request comes in to a gateway on chain A, then Axel validators read this request, execute some consensus and multi-party cryptography protocols, and then execute the corresponding write request on chain B. Now, to actually make this happen, what you need is you need an overlay of consensus protocols with multi-party protocols, um, with multi-party cryptography protocols, right? So for example, um, you know, um, what is, I think a lot of listeners may be familiar with the concept of a multi-signature, right? Uh, so a multi-sig, so what is a multi-sig, uh, you know, on a high level, you have an account that's controlled by sort of lots of keys, you can think of it that way. And there is a certain threshold of uh, participants that have to authorize that transaction, right? So uh, Axler, and as an example, you could uh, support sort of multi-sig, but also more complicated like threshold cryptographic protocols that um, have you know, different properties and a little bit more optimal for certain use cases. But on the high level, they allow this set of Axler validators in a decentralized way to agree on a decision that has to be made with respect to this external um, gateway account. And so to actually make this happen, this uh, multi-party crypto protocols, validators need to sort of propagate messages to each other and they actually have to reach 
a consensus on those messages through the blockchain. Right? So a lot of the kind of work that we've done um, over the last year has been in overlaying these uh, multi-party cryptography protocols from you know, multi-signatures to uh, threshold signatures with um, Cosmos-based Tendermint consensus so that validator set is not kind of permissioned. It's not controlled by us. Anybody can come in, anybody can join, and anybody can leave the system, and the system is going to be continuing to be functional. So you have kind of key rotation protocols, you have membership changes that have to be taken by the protocol. Um, and that's actually a very challenging task. And, uh, you know, one of the reasons going back to your question, um, kind of what are existing solutions out there is like a lot of the bridges today, they're, they're, you know, centralized, right? Because they don't have this functionality to allow validators to come in and out of the system, um, because building that does require kind of more sophisticated um, distributed system techniques, but as well as uh, kind of cryptographic techniques. Yeah, that's the big concern with the, the POS um, is that it's not fully distributed, right? Is that it's all kind of like super centralized. I know we were talking about that a little bit earlier. Um, I did see when I was reading that um, something some people are real interested in is that public key name services. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit about that and how other people are using that too. I, I know that people familiar with the space will already be a, a little bit familiar. Yeah, I mean, I, I think public key name services are an example of an application layer protocol, right, that we're going to have to support one day uh, in the blockchain ecosystem, right? So on a high level, you know, um, suppose you create uh, sort of an account on a chain A, right, and you want uh, other users to be able to uh, transfer uh, funds to you, right? But if I'm a user on a different network, right, well, how do, how do I do this, right? Like, how do I know your account? How do I you know, um, link it to and so on and so forth. And so you can imagine a next layer of uh, protocols built on top that allows you to map like a, you know, an identifier, perhaps your name, right? Or perhaps your handle to a public key. And that identifier can be then, um, you know, can be uh, shared across different blockchains, right? So if I'm, if I'm a, you know, Sergey, I have an identifier on, Kind of cosmos ecosystem maybe on avalanche and so on and so forth and these identifiers are then mapped to my public keys right and so whenever you want to uh, transfer funds to me you can send it to the identifier and there's application layer protocols that map it to the correct public key on the correct chain and then allow me to actually you know receive my funds right so um again it's an example of an application layer protocol that we can build but it does require the surf you know decentralized interoperability network first, right? To be um, to be actually process these messages and uh, kind of send information from one chain to another. Yeah, that's the, everybody's really excited about the, yeah, you know, my my name dot whatever, the, the kind of the seeming, I've heard it referred to by people as like a, the DNS of Ethereum. And I was like, yeah, you're getting close. You're getting kind of close. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. So maybe um, with some of your experience and, and prior experience in some of these proof of stakes, especially at proof of stake uh, blockchains and environments, especially with um, the current situation that's going on around the world, the IMF's labeled cryptization a threat. What have you seen on uh, the cryptographic side in terms of countries coming in and saying, Hey, you can't really do that, or hey, we're going to regulate that. I know some countries, you know, they won't let you encrypt stuff above a certain uh, level, uh, or some countries require you to encrypt it to a certain level. Is that any sort of concern in developing these um, POS blockchains? So it's a great question. Um, yeah. So I think if you look at kind of cryptography in isolation, right, then the the friction between, I would say, cryptographers and the governments has been going on for the last 30 years. Okay, so <laughs> it's not a it, it, it's not a new thing where somebody comes in and says, "Well, you know, let's put a backdoor into this, uh, you know, encryption algorithm or uh, into the scheme itself." And you know, every few years you have sort of petitions of cryptographers from all over the world, institutions saying, "Okay, this is a really bad idea," right? Like here's you know, 100 people leading the field that are telling you this is a bad idea, no, you shouldn't do it. And, uh, you know, in some countries it works better than others, <laughs> um, this, this approach, but um, I would say it's not, um, it's not new. I think when it comes to, um, you know, building proof of stake networks, 
Um, I haven't really seen that. I think a lot of it, um, a lot of the talks has been more about, you know, whether or not you're selling like securities, right? Or you're distributing it to the people you shouldn't be distributing to, or, you know, um, kind of a basic uh, KYC AML requirements um, around the distribution. Um, I haven't seen kind of cryptography played out um, kind of a big part of it uh, specifically yet. Uh, yeah, no, definitely. I do think that um, that's kind of like second and third order type effects that yeah, really yeah. the, because, you know, one of the, the most anonymous, the best, most anonymous decentralized communication network was developed, I believe, by the CIA. So yeah. it's one of the cra crazy types of things that, um, do you think that in terms of things like when El Salvador says, okay, well, we're going to go ahead and uh, have Bitcoin as the legal tender here now and give everybody a wallet. Do you think that those mm -hmm. things actually help in terms of uh, widening the adoption? Or do you think it just drives a stake in to people saying, well, yeah, those people are just crazy. They're fringe and all this other sort of stuff. I mean, I do think it, it, it helps, right? Because I think it, A, it, uh, it brings, you know, um, new attention, I think, right? And I think more actors starting to pay attention to it and think, you know, is this a good idea or is it a bad idea? I mean, I, um, I think every country will have to and every jurisdiction will have to make sort of its own decisions. But the reality is that like the bottom line is that, you know, over the last kind of few decades, we've been entering more and more of a global economy, right? And a global world. And I think what's lacking is still basic ability to kind of transact across jurisdictions, right? Um, I mean, and for that, I, I strongly believe that just to get there, you really have to rebuild the financial infrastructure on newer stacks, okay? Newer software stacks that have much better properties, you know, can easily allow for competition for people to enter and build better applications, build on each other's tools and data sets and so on and so forth. Just like we see, you know, in the web, um, kind of a, you know, the, the barrier for entry is, is pretty low right now, right? Um, you know, I can go and spin up a website and start selling things. You know, in a, in a week or so, if I if I really want, but that does not exist. You know, in financial markets, they're completely controlled. And I think if we really want to support global economies, and if we really want to support um, global trade, I do think the infrastructure has to be um, has to be rebuilt from scratch. And I, and I do strongly believe it has to be built around open networks. I yeah, I agree with you, and I do. I like that um, we have to build we have to rebuild the stacks from from scratch. Because I've been in that environment before where, man, it really does hurt. We're going to have to rip out all that legacy equipment. But believe me, $30,000 right now is better than when you get hacked for, you know, a million down the road because we're running yeah. on, on legacy spec. So yeah. what do you think about maybe the future of governance and isn't governments? Maybe it's something like a DAO. Um, mm -hmm. What have you seen in your experience uh, building these blockchains? Uh, with DAOs and what are what are your opinions around DAOs and and the future of governance in the digital age? Yeah, I mean I think DAOs are interesting, and I but I do think that to solve DAOs, um, you know, we have to first solve like how do we build a decentralized uh, organization to begin with, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. autonomous I think is a is a feature <laughs> that comes on top <laughs> of decentralized organization, but um, you know I think. A lot of the blockchain projects today are still um, um, kind of a struggling, let's say, to hire abroad, right? Like to figure out um, kind of where people can come in and, and join them. Like, how do you pay them, right? Like, how do you set up payrolls and like taxes and all that stuff? And it's sort of a, you know, a part of just running a sort of a decentralized organization. And then, you know, you can think about how do you actually make it autonomous? Um, I mean, that being said, I do think um, DAOs on their own a good for specific project, but not all projects, right? So in particular, um, I what I have seen a lot of the DAOs do is a sort of a, you know, kind of a contractual model, right? Where you can come in, maybe put a like a proposal, right? Like, okay, I'm gonna do this thing for, for the next like two months. Maybe you get kind of a pay from the DAO to do this project. Um, but the reality is that because we're still kind of in the infrastructure layer, I would say in the blockchain space, a lot of the stuff has to be built. And a lot of the stuff takes, kind of a um, longer to build, right? And you, you need kind of experts that can stay around for longer, that can train other people that are joining the project and, um, you know, and so, and so on and so forth. And you need multiple coordinated teams to do, to do this effort. And um, 
Um, so while I do think DAOs, you know, have benefits and and uh, applicable for some types of projects, um, I think we need to think a little bit how do you work with them better for um, for some of like infrastructure project while they're still being built. More of a sustainable type thing and less of a, a we're going to make a Dogecoin DAO or something. You know? yeah, yeah, definitely. So. In terms of something that's a little bit more exciting these days, um, NFTs. Uh, let's talk about uh, we can talk. Let's talk about first about the actual real world use cases in terms of you know uh, how POS blockchains might use NFTs versus you know, and we can later then get on into the genitur of art, the stuff that's actually going on right now. So let's talk a little bit about. Um, NFTs, their long-term use cases, uh, especially on POS blockchains. Yeah, um, I mean, I think NFTs are incredibly exciting, right? I think you know people have been talking about them again, like for the last you know, seven, eight years, right? Ever since the early days of the blockchains. But I think now you're starting to see actually some of it come to reality. I'm uh, particularly would be very excited to see more um, kind of ownership rights being sort of NFT, right? <laughs> um, and um, you know, just to give you an example, like, you know, car registrations, right? Um, you know, um, anything that has to do around kind of a identity or ownership of uh, property or, you know, assets or things like that. I think I'm, I'll be very excited to see kind of a more of that. Um, I think digital media kind of NFTs are incredibly exciting as well, because they really allow to, um, again, remove intermediaries between like creators and consumers, right? And so you can have a platform that connects kind of content creators that uh, makes interesting material for the consumers and those providers can directly interact with their, with their user bases essentially, right? And understand what they are, tune their products uh, and uh, kind of earn from it uh, in the process. So I'm excited about that, um, I think as well. And I would like to see, you know, more, music right like videos and so on and so forth kind of continue entering that space i think now it's it's still a lot of it is around sort of jpegs but i'm starting to see more and more of interest in other <laughs> kind of a content um starting to appear you know there's they the jpeg stuff the right click save as you know it gets a lot of hate it does but i do think uh you know and this is just a personal opinion is yeah it's a fragmenting of the pop culture space. I don't think that we've always had this kind of mass media environment where everybody's been, you know, hey, you know, Big Macs, Nikes, we're going to go out by Beanie Babies. And it's kind of like a get off, get off my lawn moment. I don't have one. So I'm going to ask the million dollar question. Do, do you have an NFT right now, especially a PFP NFT? Well, I mean, I, I do have, uh, you know, some NFTs, uh, you know, we actually created an NFT series at Axelar, uh with a robotic team, uh, and we've been distributing that to the to the community. And uh, um, I, by the way, like on that, you know, when we're working with with an artist uh, to create those NFTs. And I was just amazed by their work, right? Like, I mean, um, like the level of detail that went into those things like ended up being you know 65 megabyte like per image which if you kind of zoom in you can see you know like scratches on these robots and uh, you know like fine grained details which uh, i mean i never paid too close of an attention to these things until we actually you know started to work with an artist and i uh, kind of creating those things and giving them feedback uh so um, I don't know. I, I I really enjoyed the process. I think it was a, you know one of the first experiences where we both uh, kind of worked with an artist on it and then distributed it to our community. And it was um, it was really nice to to participate in that. Yeah, extraordinarily exciting, especially for breaking down that barrier between the artists and the consumers, because every single person that I talked to has said the level of detail and the amount of work that goes into these artists that, that are putting in it's 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 unmatched so and I, I was unaware of that so let's talk a little bit before we wrap up here um how can people come out and help y'all um let's I know we talked about it a little bit before but let's talk and let's wrap it up on how people can come and get involved in the test net and um what the actual like wh where y'all need some um volunteers or even people to come out and help y'all yeah, so, uh, you know, the, the test net is, of course, uh, running and we're going to be making it more and more uh, kind of accessible and inviting more and more people uh, around it. You know, we're looking for folks to create technical documentation, you know, translations, um, kind of content, uh, help us, you know, fix bugs and so on and so forth and, and create better tooling around the system. 
Um, the second avenue is around ecosystem tooling that you know any network that you're building requires wallet integrations, you know, dashboards, uh, analytics, uh, engines, you know, indexers, and so on and so forth. And so we are definitely inviting the community to contribute to those tools and build the, them around the network. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, I am still excited to, to work with other artists as well, I think, in the space. I think we have, you know, pretty interesting plans uh, for, uh, you know, building interesting things around Axler. And, uh, you know, by the way, like speaking of NFTs, like right now we're in the creation phase, but the next thing will be again, like how do you interoperate this NFTs, right? Like somehow I ended up with my NFT on Solana, but I want to, you know, stake and get a loan against it on, um, you know, Avalanche, right? Or, or some other chain, like, well, you're going to need interoperability protocol. So I think uh, I'm pretty excited uh, for that as well. Wait, I hadn't even considered it. I had not even considered that. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Gorbanov. That's Dr. Sergey Gorbanov, uh, co-founder co and CEO of the Axelar Network. Uh, formerly, he was on the founding cryptography team at uh, Algorand, and he won the Sproul's Doctoral Thesis Award for Best Thesis Computer Science at MIT. Thank you so much for your time uh, this morning, well, thanks Dr. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. It was great.